So you want to make a game without an engine, eh? Well, I've been doing it full time for the last five years. I've made these three Steam games so far. And I want to make this video so that I could walk you through the process of how I make games and all my main systems that I have for making shit without an engine. So that instead of, you know, spending three or four years to get to a point where you actually start making stuff like me, um, you can just kind of skip that, skip straight to my homework answers and start making games straight away. Cause there's like a handful of mindset shifts that I'm going to go over in this video and systems that I use that kind of just like put you straight into being able to make something in a couple weeks. I'm going to be giving you all the source code so you can, you know, just jump straight into it yourself and yeah, just skip over all the years that it took me to learn this stuff the hard way. To kick things off, this right here is a condensed repository of pretty much everything I've learned over the last five years. I'm calling it the blueprint and it's what I'm using right now to make my current game, which is a factory builder. And in this vid, I'm basically going to go over the three main systems that I use in here every single day and exactly how I use them to you know, make games and actually be productive instead of rabbit holing on random tech things. So you can check it out, link below. It is completely free, MIT licensed, all that jazz. So let's dive into it, shall we? Uh, this guy isn't really a game engine or a framework. It's a blueprint for making games. Now, what that means is it's more like a set of systems that you can use to jump straight into gameplay programming, you know, without worrying about any of the tech stuff like graphics, sound, entity structure, whatever, right? Now, the main benefit here is that when you do actually need to worry about those things later on, it's designed to be expanded upon and just like ripped to shreds to make the exact game that you want to make. Because, you know, games are complicated. Every game is going to have its own constraints and like stuff that it needs to do specifically. So trying to make like a generic engine that can make all of these games just ends up being like this massive task and it's completely pointless because we're here to just make a game right so why don't we just make a game instead of trying to make a generic engine that's mindset shift number one by the way that's why i'm that's why i'm calling it no engine game dev because there is no engine here uh it's not an api that you interface with it's literally just code that you own one of the biggest problems with like going off and starting out, you know, making your own game engine is that we think that we need to make like all this tech and all these systems before being able to like start work on the game. When in reality, you know, it's completely backwards. First, come up with the game design. Then that tells you what tech that you actually need in order to make the game. You don't go out and like make an engine. You just literally make the game. So yeah, that's what this is. It's uh, all just code for kind of making a game with as little friction and as little structure as possible, specifically 2D pixel art games, which, you know, I'm going to go into that in a little bit. But before we do that, let's dive into a bit about the language that I'm using here, because uh, in the past I've used C++, C, even Jonathan Blow's Jai Beta, if you're familiar with that. But these days I'm using Odin. That's kind of what I landed on for my daily driver. I'm not going to go into the specifics of like, you know, pros and cons versus all the other languages and like why I landed on this decision. It'll take way too long. <laughs> but all you need to know is that I, it's what I'm using right now for game dev because uh, I think it's the best. Without further ado, let's jump into the blueprint and what is actually inside here. In terms of the actual graphics in here, what this looks like from a high level perspective as gameplay programmers, all we need to do, draw up a sprite in a sprite, okay? Hit a button that runs an export script. Then in code, all we do is just call like draw sprite of the thing that we just exported and that's pretty much it. It's right there, ready to go. The time between like changing a sprite or adjusting the animation and actually seeing it in the context of the game is like just a couple seconds and it's beautiful. So that helps me get like way more improvement cycles in, which ultimately leads to the art looking better because it's just a low friction to like experiment and just have fun drawing stuff. And that's really cool. I won't go in depth into like everything that's going on behind the scenes here. If you want, you know, you can just go read the source code to see how it's working. One of the biggest hurdles I think for like no engine game dev is that to get started, you kind of need to go out and learn graphics programming. You have the dreaded hello world triangle <laughs> or, you know, if you don't want to do that, 
you can use an existing framework, but then doing that kind of kneecaps what you're able to pull off long term. The moment you need to actually do anything a little bit more complicated when it comes to rendering, you need to have a way to write your own graphics pipeline and actually do the rendering yourself. So it's a bit of a hairy problem. The way I've solved this is, you know, I've actually gone in and written up a simple 2D sprite renderer. It renders everything in one draw call. If you don't know what any of this is, by the way, I, I wouldn't worry about it. That's actually the main benefit of this is that we don't need to worry about how any of this works. We can just call the draw sprite and that's like kind of it at the end of the day. <laughs> uh, but when you do need to like go in and you know, say add something in because the game that you're trying to make needs this very specific graphics thing. You know, that's we can dive in, you know, do the learn opengl.com, figure out exactly what is happening here. That way, you know, long term, you just know graphics programming and know exactly how to change things, which is cool. Most of that isn't really needed right out of the gate. Honestly, the system that I've got right here is capable of making all three games that I've made in the past. Like there's no, like there's no fancy extra graphics pipeline step happening here. It's just we're drawing sprites more or less. The cool thing here is that we've got the shader right here that we can edit. So, you know, you can learn a little bit about how the shaders work and like that's kind of all you need to do. There is the pixel shader here and that just operates on all the pixels. So you can do specific effects like lighting, you know, swapping in some kind of repeating texture, overriding things to be specific colors. Um, I did a Minecraft style cracks texture animation thing the other day for breaking something. That was really cool. So all that can be done with just the simple kind of pixel shader that we have here. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot you can do here. I wish I had this one starting out ages ago because it would have let me kind of just skip straight to programming the game. And I wouldn't have rabbit holed as much on learning some of the graphics programming stuff. But at the end of the day, we're here. Sometimes rabbit holes are good. So this next part, if you understand this, you'll be able to create sound effects and soundscapes that add just a shitload of visceral feel to the game. Now, sound design is extremely important. I slept on this for like a long, long time. Don't make that same mistake. Get into it ASAP. It ends up being something like 50% of game feel. Listen to this without sound. It's night and day, right? We have two senses when we're playing a game. We have our visual and we have our auditory, right? It's half of the feel, but it gets completely ignored. Like if you look at Steam review of a game, you aren't gonna see like people saying, oh yeah, bro, this, this sound design is banger. Uh, it's just one of those things that kind of just sits in the background, but you, you notice it when it's wrong, right? <laughs> so it makes sense to have a workflow that makes creating new sounds and like doing the sound design as easy and frictionless as possible, you know, just like the art. So what I've landed on for this is using FMOD. In the past, I tried, you know, making my own sound playback system from scratch and all this shit, but it ends up being way worse because Great sound design, like anything, is a function of just how many iterations you can get in. An iteration being like you make something, you hear something in the context of the game and get feedback on it and then make a tweak and then do it again, right? That's like an iteration. So the more times you can do that cycle, the better the sound ends up sounding, <laughs> right? So yeah, FMOD is great for just like really, really quickly getting stuff sounding good. You know, you just like sit there spamming spacebar over and over, over again to like hear it. You know, you can hear how it gets spatialized in the world if you're doing that. I basically just made some kind of wrappers and helpers on top of FMOD to make working with it better. You know, just hiding all the ugly API behind the scenes. The entire workflow looks like make an event in the editor, hit the build hotkey, play it with a single function. There you go, you got sound. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much the gist of the sound, really. Uh, the only downside here is that FMOD has some pretty hefty licensing terms. You know, you got to put a splash logo on startup, but honestly, worth it. Like, the amount of creative expression you get from this and the more iterations you can get in on the sound leads to everything feeling way, way better. And I think it's worth the price, personally. Last but not least, we got the third kind of big main system that I use on a daily basis, which is the entity system. Now, this is the thing that kind of just connects everything together and like allows us to actually make the game. If you understand how to use this, you'll be able to throw stuff into the game really, really quickly. And it'll feel almost as frictionless and high level as something like a 
you know, a Unity or Godot script, you know, how you got the little script and it's like attached to the object and you're just kind of writing it out and like that's how you program the entity kind of gameplay. Over the years, I've actually put pretty much converged on that exact design when it comes to entities because it's just, it's it's goaded, right? <laughs> um, so instead of falling into the trap of like making this massive, complicated entity component system, what I like to do is keep it dead simple. Uh, there's a single structure for the entity, gets used for all of them. We got an enum for each kind of entity Entity, and then we just have a big array and that's it. You just kind of create an entity. We have a setup function here, which actually defines like the behavior of the entity and like everything that we do with it. That's kind of it. As a little example, when I'm programming here, I'm sitting in the setup function. And this is kind of that, that script example I was talking about earlier. It's like all in the one spot here. This is how we program the entire logic for the entity. Uh, we give it a bunch of like constant data if it needs it. And then there's the update and render procs inside here. There are procs like functions that you call, right? And yeah, that's how you just do the actual logic for them. And it works really well. As an example for like, let's say we're programming a slime and I'm trying to get it to jump. And I want like some kind of timer on whenever it jumps. I would take that piece of state, just add it to the entity. There we go. I could just use it from there and I'm, and I'm good to go, right? On paper, this kind of seems a little bit wasteful because we're just using one entity struct and we're just dumping all of this state into it. You know, a slime will have this slime jump timer, but like, is that going to get used by like a goblin over here? No, it's, it's completely fucking useless, right? It seems wasteful and that's because it kind of is, <laughs> but you'd be surprised how little this matters um, due to a couple things. Like one, we're really low level. So in general, when we're programming, we're like literally one step away from the actual CPU instructions that get generated and like fed into the CPU. So there's very little waste that is happening. So by default, whatever you program is gonna get optimized really well and be really fast. So that's kind of number one. Number two is the game state is very data oriented. Like this entire entity array, it's just a single array. So everything's very kind of back to back in memory. So that means the CPU cache is going to be happy chappy and things are going to be pretty fast. Yeah, I said like data oriented. That's that's a very loaded term. It can mean whatever you want it to mean. <laughs> in this case, it's just we have all these entities kind of packed back to back and usually we're just looping over them and doing like bulk operations on things. And it's pretty fast because they're all kind of packed together. Now, the thing with this is that the specifics of this entire system can change depending on the game you're trying to make. This is more or less how I start off every game and I'll just add complexity as I need it. Like if I've got a problem I need to solve, like, you know, I'm seeing a performance issue somewhere or I'm getting completely bottlenecked by memory, then I will try and figure out the solution to the problem. But I'm not trying to figure out the solution to the problem before I even have the fucking problem. So yeah, that's why I have this big structure. It's called the Megastruct uh, coined by Ryan Flurry. I learned it from uh, him back in the day. Man, I was, I was literally sitting there writing an ECS and he pulled me aside and he was like, bro, People, when you're when you program, people are like, oh, like, you know, don't don't waste memory or like, don't do like, and I'm just sitting here thinking like, after having programmed for like a long time, I'm like looking at my computer and I'm like, this thing is absurdly fast and it can do a billion things. People can write software rasterizers that render like a billion pixels. I don't know if it's actually a billion, probably more like a million pixels, like in one sixtieth of a second. And I'm sitting here like making sure my entities are like these tight little things. And I'm like, that doesn't need to happen. Like, let's just, gotcha. you know, you can just do the pig thing and just like put everything into it. And I've been doing that ever since. And it's been absolutely amazing. So TLDL, keep it simple, solve actual problems that arise, not imaginary ones. We can break stuff out later on and optimize it later on if we want. It's just that we're opting into the extra complexity. By default, we're operating in a way that's like, again, really easy to just stay in gameplay programming mode, add in some state, get back to doing what we're doing. You know, we just have a big old sloppy state dump that we can throw shit into in the heat of the moment, which less friction, less friction leads to more iterations happening on the gameplay, more iterations, better game. It's the exact same with the other two systems. And I'm convinced at this point that this is literally how you get fast and better at everything is you just, you just need to close that feedback cycle as soon as possible. By the way, a little pro extra tip, same thing happens at like the massive kind of high level in terms of game design. You need to prototype all the systems and close out the loop as soon as possible and then give it to someone else to play test and you can get feedback from that. That's one iteration. Game design literally does not start until you do that first play test and like see the entire game. That's how you actually make the game at the end of the day. But that's a, uh, that's a video for another day. <laughs> so yeah, all the gameplay programming is central to this one setup function. You can kind of think of it like the Unity or Godot script, right? 
And I did it this way because there's nothing worse than going through adding a new piece of content, like weapons or an enemy or your know, items, buildings, whatever it is for the design. You go to add that in, but then like you have to add it in at like five different fucking spots in the code base. And then you like miss a spot and you just get a runtime crash because you fucked up. Like there's, there's nothing worse than having to think about where to go to add stuff in. You just kind of want to make it as easy as possible so that you can kind of like, if you're adding in a new enemy, for example, and you've already done an enemy, you can kind of just look at the other one as a reference and maybe copy paste it over as like a starting point. Um, so yeah, it's all centralized, makes things like way, way easier as we kind of scale up later on. And yeah, the, the, the main thing about this entire entity system is that it's so incredibly flexible and gives us full power of being able to make these big, wide sweeping generic systems like an item system and just have it by default shared across all the entities because it is literally just one entity structure, right? So you can kind of have the dream almost of like this like ECS architecture. Let's say for the physics system, for example, I would just add a does physics flag. And then we have the pause velocity acceleration, the collision box, all this kind of stuff on the entity. Now I've written that once it applies to all the entities. It's just right there. Extremely flexible makes making the game really, really easy because you can make these, you know, really nice systems like that. And shit just works. It's very fun. At the end of the day, all this is an effort to make adding in new content as easy as possible because, you know, once you've kind of got the game design in, it becomes a matter of just adding in new content to that design so that the players can play more of the game. So it makes sense that making adding in content easier leads to making more content, which leads to more game to play. Happier players, big win. This is Overall, you know, the best system I've found for making gameplay programming as easy as possible. It's kind of cool because we're like really low level, but things still feel extremely high level and easy to make game. Now, obviously, there's you know, way more to this to actually make a game. And I'll, you know, try and cover more about that with my content coming up. But in the meantime, if you would like to get personal help from me to use this blueprint to make whatever game idea you want. I'm basically running a mentorship program where I just walk you through every step of the process. I've helped a bunch of guys out so far. Yeah, check out the link down in the description and uh, we can work together. But anyway, hopefully this blueprint makes it easier and increases the odds of you actually making a game because it has for me only after, you know, investing the five years and learning how to get here. <laughs> but hopefully that uh hopefully all this time skips a little bit of that for you regardless making a game without an engine is still going to be fucking hard but but we do it not because it is easy but because it is difficult <laughs>